Um, the current position that I can, I can only really guess, but the current position seems to be that if we stick our heads in the sand, the problem will go away. No one's addressing it. Everyone seems to conveniently, conveniently ignore it, like, oh, well, we just won't talk about that. Um, uh, my solution, is, which is something I was going to touch on later, but I can touch on it now, is I make myself a standard filter, which I apply before I start grading. And what it does is it pulls all the white levels down below 100. Nearly all cameras are going to deliver pictures to you with white above 100%. Very few camera operators especially with modern cameras with you know, like less sophisticated viewfinders and everything, they don't really show them what they're dealing with. It's, the pictures look good no matter how bad they are. You know, and generally, you know, people will go over and adjust the monitor to make the picture look good rather than adjust the camera. And so you'll get underexposed and overexposed pictures. Um, so you need to know what you're dealing with. So if they are recording up around 109%, which is nearly all of the small format cameras because you can't adjust it, um, you want to know <laughs> before you start grading what's going on. So I have this um, filter which I've developed over a period of time, which I'll just show you in my little bin here. This one at the top here, colour three-way, white equals 235. The simple explanation for that is that the way the bit depth works in digital on this application is that peak white, the maximum you can get is 255 bits of information. The 100% white point is bit 235. Uh, broadcast video goes from bit 16 to bit 235. RGB video or graphics or any other electronic generated stuff is bit 0 to 255. Final Cut Pro will import graphics and QuickTime movies and any other media and correct the black point, but it won't correct that white point. And the stuff that comes out of cameras does the, the same kind of thing. So let me just go in here and remove the filters I've got on here. And we'll just apply my standard filter, which is that one. And then we'll have a bit of a look at this little waveform monitor. Let's drop that back down there. Have a look at the hist histogram on the top right. You'll see very easily what's going on here. Now, this three-way colour corrector has a, a sort of sort of go out into a little loop here because this is interesting. You can get into numeric controls. You can plug numbers into the colour corrector. Um, may seem unnecessary, but this is the area where you can keyframe the colour corrector. So you can make gradual changes over the time. So if someone does an iris pull and the exposure goes up or down, you can put a keyframe in here and you can adjust the opposite direction and fix a problem that has occurred over a period of time. But it also allows you to look in here and find all kinds of interesting stuff like you can write information down if you want to copy things onto a pad or something. You can write numbers out of here. But highlight controls, 235. When you put the standard filter in, that's 255. <coughs> and you can see in the background there what's going on. So I just make myself a filter that says 235, which pulls anything that's sitting at 255 down to 235. Bang, nothing's over white now. Everything, everything that's absolutely maximum that they can give you from a camera is now going to sit at the white point. It's a great way to see those details in that little top 9% that the LCD screen won't show you. So now you can really see that stuff. This may not be a particularly good picture to do it with. Let's have a look. No, it's not really that great for that, but believe me, it works. <laughs> it saves you a lot of aggravation. Pretty much it, Skype. Peter, if you're just yeah. working on the web where pretty much everyone looks at a CRO and LCD screen, do you need to apply to any of the specific uses for that medium to bring you down those white levels, or does it not really matter for that? It's, uh, yeah, you, you're quite right. Anything that's non broadcast, you don't have those delivery requirements. So, 
yeah, you can go up to bit 255, you can use the 109% luminance. It's not going to be much of a problem. As long as you keep in mind that those details in the white won't show on those people's monitors at home. So, and the place you lose that detail is in things like clouds and in highlights and reflections. All the things that give the gloss to an image. So, yeah, you don't have to, but you'll get better images if you maintain that 100% point because you guarantee that you're not going to lose any information at the other end. Um, okay, get into a little bit of um, preparation stuff now because this is uh, fairly important. Yeah, please. If you change it, it'll remember it. Yeah. But if your preferences get upset or trashed, then it'll go back to the default, which is white. Yeah. What's the name of that tool? Uh, oh, I'll show you. I'll close it down and we'll open it up. If you go to the tools menu, it's called video scopes. And the video scopes and the frame reviewer, they, they open up to, in a thing called Toolbench. If you have a look at the, I can't, I probably can't see it. It's called Toolbench, and if so, if I open up something else, like a frame viewer, it goes into the Toolbench, and then it's tabbed. I generally work with two monitors and separate them all out, so I've got it all open at once. And um, sort of naturally leads us to the frame viewer, which is a wonderful tool for colour grading. This is a tool that allows you to look at something else in the timeline whilst grading a current shot. This is pretty much the way Telus Any Chains used to work. They'd grab a freeze frame of a particular grade, they'd usually have a, a whole bunch of frames. This is kind of like a similar kind of thing. Uh, you can choose what you look at. You can choose the previous edit. You can choose the second edit back. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, transitions upset it. <laughs> so it works for cuts. It doesn't work so well with transitions. And I'll just demonstrate that. If I'm sitting here, you'll notice it's uh, not actually showing the right thing if I go to previous edit it shows white that's because the previous transition is white it goes back to the previous frame and it's got a transition across it to get around that you can use in point or out point so quite often I'll grade a, a master shot like a wide shot might be the master shot for a scene if you're doing drama work that kind of thing and I'll mark that as an in point so for example if I wanted to use that as a reference for colour, I just mark that in. Sorry about the messiness here. Step back to the next shot. Now I've got the previous shot. The good thing is you can choose the precise frame that you want to look at when you use an endpoint or an outpoint. That can be very handy because if there's a lot of movement in sporting things, you might want a particular frame that represents the colour you're looking for and you want to define it precisely. Without defining an in-point, you can't really do that. So if I go in-point, bang. On that frame viewer, it's quite simple and yet it's quite sophisticated at the same time. It will default to a 50-50 left-right split. The good thing is, you can pick that up and you can move it. So now I can look at the other side of the picture. If I'm trying to match like if this bloke was in the background of that other shot, I can do this and say, okay, you're there. Or I might want to match the skin tone or I might want to match the tone of, um, I don't know, his leg or something. <laughs> so you can, but this is really flexible because you can customise it to suit what you're doing. And um, it's always nice to be able to make the tools do what you want rather than you having to work around the tools.